Good afternoon. This is Ed Wilkin with the accounting firm of Wilkin and Gutton Plan. I'm a shareholder with the firm. Um, to begin today, I'd like to introduce the speakers. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, all three of the speakers uh, ahead of time, but then I will announce when each one is coming on. And also, you'll be able to see that on your on the screen. Um, Thomas Giamma. Uh, Thomas Giamma graduated from uh, Dickerson College, uh, Political Science, as well as from St. John's University of Law. He clerked for the U.S. Magistrate, uh, John Manna, U.S. District Court, District of New Jersey, and for the Honorable William T. Wichman, Judge, Superior Court of New Jersey. He is a member of the New Jersey and New York Bars and has been in private practice since 1986. Over the course of his professional career, Tom has provided advice and counsel to over 250 condo HOAs in New Jersey. His firm, Giamo & Associates, LLC, Rumson, New Jersey, focuses exclusively on community association law. Alan Canner, our second speaker, graduated from Harvard Law School and then clerked for the late Judge Robert S. Vance of the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. He founded his firm, Canner and Whiteley, in 1981, has since acquired a national reputation in the fields of complex litigation, environmental law, consumer fraud. Allen is a frequent speaker and lecturer on various topics and has testified numerous times before the Louisiana legislature. Allen is currently representing the state of Louisiana in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill litigation as well as the state of New Jersey against ExxonMobil in a major national resources damage claim case. Allen is also a member of the bars in California, District of Columbia, Louisiana, New Jersey, Oklahoma, New York, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, and Texas. Uh, Chris uh, Tremaine, is founder and principal of Tremaine Enterprises, Inc., has established himself as a specialist in the world of structural and non-structural valuations of claim facilities, the damage resulting from natural and man-made catastrophes. Uh, his client, clients range from single-family dwellings, historical buildings, educational institutions, and church facilities to entire incorporated cities throughout the United States. He has been instrumental in assisting clients of major disasters for over 20 years. Most recently, those affected by Hurricane Katrina, Rita and Ike, the 2010 Chilean earthquake, and the 2011 Midwest tornadoes. Mr. Tremaine has operated as a public adjuster and consultant for over 30 year, 13 years, an appraiser for over nine years, and has over 20 years' experience in the construction industry. Amongst his multiple duties, his primary focus are to focus on assisting clients through the evaluation process of damage leading to the necessary teams of consultant experts to tabulate the cost to restore clients to their pre-loss condition. Uh, we're going to do the first polling question now. To get a sense of the audience, please indicate whether you're a professional, um, board member, homeowner, property manager, or other. Uh, I'll give you a, a minute to take care of that. Thanks. Okay, it looks like uh, from what I see here, the majority of um, of the people, either property manager or board members, homeowners. You have a few professionals and a few others. Uh, what I'd like to now is turn the presentation over to uh, Tom Giamo to uh, start our webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to participate in this very important webinar, which we're presenting for uh, boards, property managers, homeowners, unit owners, and other professionals in the industry who, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, have been handed some very profound and deeply uh, novel issues, to say the least. We all know that Hurricane Sandy hit us very hard, especially those community associations located along the water. And we all recognize that community associations in New Jersey are administrated and managed by elected governing boards. My remarks this afternoon, by and large, will be directed to the governing boards. Boards, as we all know, are, rec are comprised of volunteers who just simply make themselves available to make decisions for their community. In the wake of Hurricane Sandy, I have, and I dare say all other community association professionals, have seen boards struggle mightily with the novel and far-reaching issues which impact their community. Those struggles have not only been encountered by the boards, 
but as well by the community property managers, their consulting engineers, their insurance agents, as well as their legal counsel. Given that New Jersey has never experienced a natural disaster such as Sandy, it's, under, it's very, very easy to understand why everyone is struggling to get their arms around what needs to be properly done in order to get their community back to normal. Sandy has and continues to present profound issues on a recurring daily basis, which for boards and their professionals are clearly of first impression. So all you did was volunteer to serve your board. We recognize that you're somewhat uncomfortable making these decisions right now, and do you have any personal exposure? Well, here's the answer. Volunteers who serve on a community association governing board serve in a fiduciary capacity. The overarching responsibility of any community association governing board in New Jersey is to exercise its delegated powers and to discharge its functions in a manner that protects and furthers or is not inconsistent with the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the community that the board serves. Every decision, and this is critical, every decision to be made by the governing board is to be made in the overall best interest of the community. The governing board as a whole and individual trustees that serve on that board are to discharge their duties in good faith and with that degree of diligence, care, and skill which an ordinary prudent person would exercise under similar circumstances. Trustees that serve on a board are to be faithful to and to observe their community's governing documents as well as their statutory responsibilities. In making decisions for the community, boards are to use their highest and best form of business judgment. The proper exercise of business judgment in many instances will serve to insulate the board and individuals that serve on that board from claims of a breach of fiduciary duties. What should boards be doing right now? In my opinion, it's the responsibility of the association's governing board in the wake of Hurricane Sandy to understand, assess, evaluate, and address those damages which the association has sustained. And in order to discharge those responsibilities, the governing board must, in my opinion of necessity, enlist and rely upon the advice and guidance of all of its retained professionals. Boards are comprised of lay people who come from various walks of life. Therefore, boards should look to their professionals for counsel and direction as to how the community in the wake of Sandy can get back to normal. A governing board that chooses not to engage the appropriate team to assess and address the community's damages may be shortchanging its membership as any property damages which are not compensated from either available insurance proceeds or other forms of federal and or state relief will have to be made up by the membership. Things the board should be doing right now. First and foremost, Obtain a copy of your association's insurance policy. Talk to your insurance agent and your attorney. If your property has sustained damages from Sandy, the board, in conjunction with its attorney and its insurance agent, should be reviewing the association's operative policies of insurance. Policies typically required to be secured and maintained by the association include a blanket all-risk insurance policy. A blanket all-risk insurance policy covers all risks except those which are excluded. One typical exclusion in a blanket all-risk policy deals with flooding. The board needs to understand what the association's policy covers and, as importantly, what is excluded under the policy. Insurance policies, we know from experience, vary from carrier to carrier and are often quite difficult to understand and read. We hope, we dare say, going forward that the state legislature intervenes it requires that insurance policies are written in plain language, which are easy to understand. It is an absolute imperative that the board and its attorney be provided with a full and complete copy of the insurance policy. You simply cannot work with declaration pages alone. These policies today, fortunately, are very easy to obtain, as most carriers now make them available in electronic format. If your association has sustained damage, it's imperative, an absolute imperative, the association notice its insurance carrier that it has a claim. There's an obligation on any insured, in this case the association, to notify its insurance carrier as soon as it knows or has reasons to know that it may have a claim. For a failure to timely inform the carrier as to the association's claim may allow the insurance carrier at some time going forward to disclaim based on untimely notice. Flood insurance. 
most community associations, especially those along the water, have a policy of flood insurance. Once again, the flood insurance carrier must be noticed that the association has been damaged and will be seeking compensation under the policy. A word of caution here regarding flood insurance. Federal regulations limit flood insurance to $250,000. That's it. That's the maximum. That's the cap. And in addition, flood insurance will not cover many items of personal property or contents unless the association has secured a supplemental flood insurance policy. Those communities along the water or in low-lying areas should give every consideration to purchasing a policy of flood insurance even if your community's governing documents do not require it. Boards need to have a very frank discussion with their insurance agent regarding the cost of flood insurance and the benefits which can be secured by the association under a flood policy. Registering with FEMA and applying for a small business association physical disaster loan is an imperative in the wake of Sandy. Every board should consider engaging and relying upon the association's legal counsel for guidance. Boards simply cannot go this effort alone. Legal counsel should be providing every board with those available options to secure compensation or funding to restore the association's damaged property. Those options include not only insurance claims, but an opportunity to, to apply for relief from federal, state, and local governments. A priority here is that all associations should register with FEMA and all community associations should be applying for an SBA physical disaster loan. Now, the opportunity to register with FEMA and to file for a physical disaster loan is going to be or has been extended now to March 1, 2013. In evaluating those damages which not, might not be compensated by your insurance proceeds, the board should inquire of its attorney as to the proper protocols and procedures to assess the membership in order to raise necessary funds to make repairs and to restore the association's property. Governing documents for every community association differ with respect to an assessment methodology. Hiring an insurance consultant is also a very, very important step in this particular process. For in order to assess property damages, the boards have to engage an engineering consultant, in my opinion. The consultant to be retained should have the requisite expertise and background in order to assess property damage resulting from a hurricane. Given that New Jersey has never experienced natural disasters such as Sandy, those consultants may come from other areas of the country where hurricanes, tornadoes, and the like have previously been experienced. I know we're going to be hearing from Chris Tremaine later on this afternoon, and Chris certainly has that experience. Boards should be very, very cautious in performing their own on-site evaluations for damages. Although a structure may at first blush appear to have been unaffected by wind and water brought by Sandy, it is only from an experienced engineering consultant that the association can clearly identify items of damage and the impact that the storm has had on the remaining useful life of the association's property. Given that Sandy brought hurricane force winds, of necessity the board should also have their engineering consultants review the attic spaces within their buildings in order to assess whether or not damage has occurred, which may, again, adversely impact the expected life of the building's roofing system and other related components. Once again, in my opinion, the board should not go this effort alone and without professional guidance. In terms of the insurance claims process, the board has to be prepared to stand its ground and to insist upon full and fair compensation for its claim. Trustees should avoid having discussions directly with an insurance adjuster as inadvertently declarations against interest may be made. The association should be proactive in communicating with and adjusting its loss with its insurance carrier. And critically, the board should insist that the insurance carrier react to the association's itemized damage claim and not respond to, to the carrier's offer. In my opinion, it's very, very important that boards hire experts that truly know their areas of expertise. And the board should consider the possibility that it may have to retain different types of experts in order to assess the different types of property damages which the community has sustained. For example, those communities along the water may have to, in addition to a structural engineer, retain roofing consultants and or seawall consultants. 
Insurance carriers are going to, wherever possible, disclaim coverage or reduce compensation. The charge of the board, with the assistance of its professionals, is to causally link damage to a provision contained within the insurance policy which triggers coverage. This is absolutely critical. And finally, I would encourage all, their, all of their boards and their managing agents and their attorneys to be communicating with their local municipalities and state representatives in an effort to encourage these levels of government to seek funding for their community. There are certainly going to be gaps in insurance coverage. There are going to be items of property damage which are simply not covered by insurance for one exclusion or another. Help from municipal governing bodies, the county or the state should be sought. This help, however, must be requested immediately as grant applications and other funding opportunities have hard and fast deadlines. You can apply for public assistance from the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management and FEMA. That application should be filed immediately despite the possibility that your association may not meet the criteria established by FEMA for being a private nonprofit organization. And lastly, all boards should be communicating honestly with their membership, and that communication should include both the good and the bad. The membership should be informed that there is a possibility of future assessments in order to restore the association's property. Lastly, all boards should encourage their homeowners to file individual claims with their own insurance carriers. Well, thank you, Tom, uh, for that information. I'm now going to turn the program over to uh, Alan Cantor. Uh, uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, first, thank you for participating in this important webinar. Um, having gone through Katrina um, and grown up on the Jersey Shore, I have a pretty good idea of what um, a lot of a lot of people are going through right now in terms of their frustration um, with getting, you know, full full fair and prompt compensation. Um, what we do, uh, my firm is uh, we represent first party insurance claimants, um, homeowners associations, etc. Um, in in trying to maximize their proceeds from their insurance policy. Uh, you're paying money at time. You're paying money year after year after year to make sure that when that worst possible event occurs, you're covered. Uh, that's what insurance is about. That's the promise of insurance. Um, unfortunately, it's to pay you at that moment in your life when you're most most vulnerable, and so um, that often leads to, uh, to certain issues. Uh, for example. Um, insurers generally want to get back to normal as quickly as possible. This is something we see in all these cases. Um, after, after the shock of the disaster, they want, people want normalcy. They don't want litigation. They don't want a big fight with insurance. They're not even looking for problems. They may see a window's out or there was flooding on the first floor and not think to say, I've got to look and see whether the structural integrity of the building has been compromised, whether the wear, building's wear and tear has gone um, uh, increased, whether the roofing system is, has integrity. Most people can't self-finance repairs. They're looking, unfortunately, for a quick check and some, some sense of finality early. I think they sell themselves short uh, when they do that. Uh, obviously, it's a choice people make. We usually find cycles where uh, a lot of people may want to try to make quick settlements and then realize months later that they've got very serious problems with their building. Um, insurance companies understand better than, than we do. I mean, they're professional litigants. They understand um, the psychology following a mass disaster, a natural disaster, and, and they really exploit it. Um, by, by delay. Uh, delay benefits insurers. I can't tell you how many cases we've been involved in where the adjuster comes out, wants to come out again, wants to come out again, then it's a different adjuster, then they lose your file and you've got to resubmit information. Uh, maybe it's just a terrible coincidence, but usually what happens during periods of delay is, is the insured is getting more and more anxious to get their recovery um, and uh, very often is tempted to take less than full compensation uh, during this, this problem. Now, during this situation, 
Now, if the worst thing that could happen to an insurance company is that it delays for a year in paying you, and I, and, and I understand from, from what Governor Christie was saying yesterday about the National Flood Insurance Program, people are pretty much starting now to reach uh, their limit, if they haven't already, uh, in terms of what they will or won't do with respect to insurance companies. But if the worst thing that could happen to an insurance company is, okay, they have to pay you in two years what they owed you two years ago, that's no deterrent at all, uh, which is why the law provides for something called bad faith damages. And that's a way of putting a penalty so that if the insurance company delays for two years and is wrong, acts uh, with reckless disregard, uh, they can be subject under, under the law of New Jersey to additional damages, punitive damages. Uh, and, and the idea is that when you have punitive damages, it's, it's a deterrent. Um, I think when you have like a house fire case very often or something like that, um, you, you don't really, you, those cases are handled pretty well. When you've got a mass disaster with 75 million billion in insurance losses, um, I think you see a little bit more uh, improper uh, conduct. Um, the important thing about bad faith is you have to make a record. Uh, that's one of the things a lawyer can help you do is document your file in such a way that if they are wrong um, and if they have failed to adequately adjust your claim, that, that that threat is a real threat. Uh, very often what we find is once, once these uh, investigations get going, uh, if you can explain to higher level people in the insurance company that they do have exposure for bad faith or punitive damages, uh, that they will then get suddenly get reasonable about, about making, making the claim whole. Um, the reality, though, is uh, most of the people on this webinar are one-time litigants, really. I mean, this is, this is the worst thing that happened to a lot of people. Um, uh, the insurance industry, the professional litigants, the, the claims adjusters know how to write, you know, a file so that it maximizes the company's position in litigation. People inside the company are thinking about litigation. They have lawyers reviewing the files from early on. Um, having said that, what, what the insured can do is try to put together, as Tom was talking about, the right kind of team to deal with this situation, sort of level the playing field, balance it out. Um, for example, uh, part of what you pay for in your insurance premium is really money for them to investigate your claim when, when it comes down the road. They, it should be an independent adjustment that you're getting. As a practical matter, it, it's not uh, very often an, an independent adjustment. It's one that favors the insurance company. Um, by working as a lawyer with people like Chris Tremaine, um, you know, we can put together an analysis that, that becomes sort of, uh, uh, that makes it very hard for the insurance company to beat. Uh, it becomes, it sort of sets a new bar. And very often, in a lot of cases, we do our own adjustment, uh, if we can, um, and get deliver that to the insurance company, which, which then puts them in a position where if they don't respond honestly with integrity and timeliness to it, they put themselves in a, in a dangerous position. Um, a couple of, you know, to-dos or, or things to think about. Um, you know, very often in the early stage, people tend to defer to the insurance investigator. Uh, it's important to realize that early on you can make problems uh, worse. Um, for example, you know, who's making statements to whom? I, I can't tell you how many cases, whether it's a governmental entity, school district, um, condominium association, the insurance adjuster wants to come out and rather than having a, a property manager, a lawyer or somebody uh, or a, a public adjuster walk the property with them early on, they'll just say, oh, we'll take, uh, we'll just let the custodian walk you around the property. You know, he's got all the keys. Um, and very often they'll make statements, oh, this building is a teardown, or this building is no good, or, or things that, or, or there's no damage in those other buildings, so we don't have to look at those. Um, very, very important that only 
honest and accurate statement that, that fairly represents the informed position of the insured are made. Random uninformed remarks by employees cause a lot of problems. Um, uh, very often we've got um, uh, incomplete inspections by insurers. They'll come out and say, oh, I see you've got two broken windows. They don't ask to go look and climb up on the roof and see whether there's any roof damage. Uh, this is something you can help insist upon. Um, and, you know, sometimes people will, will just get a public adjuster without, without sort of a part of a, a larger team. Uh, they may make certain statements about valuation that may be inappropriate. Uh, the most important thing, though, early on is the insurance company is setting reserves. That happens very early on very imperfect and incomplete information, and unless you're there sort of talking to insurance companies early, you're going to be fighting against those reserves all throughout the rest of the case or the process. It doesn't, you know, I would say 99% of our cases don't really even end, even after things like Katrina, Rita, I really don't end up in litigation. You put together a good file, you, you put the insurance company on notice, and then they start, they start dealing with you. But it is important to, to get, you know, to get involved early. Uh, one of the things that, that, that we advocate, I guess because we're lawyers, is that lawyer-led teams, uh, which include adjusters, are often superior to just, you know, having adjusters out there. Uh, we try to put together, and I think uh, their, their lawyer, you know, lawyers should try to put together, you know, appropriate areas of expertise. It's really a team that you've got to, to, to put together. You've got to be able to integrate legal and factual issues. Adjusters typically don't don't handle uh, contract interpretation or giving of legal advice. That's something lawyers do. It puts uh, a duty of confidentiality over the process, gives you a chance to really assess, talk candidly among yourselves uh, about problems. Um, and uh, it's very, you're also sending a message to the insurance company that if need be, you've got a team in place that can go all through trial, though you'd obviously would prefer to get your money quickly um, uh, and fully um, as soon as possible. Um, the insurance claims process, um, very simple. Uh, everybody's got an obligation uh, to, to, to provide notice of a claim that's in virtually all of these insurance contracts. Um, they're very often going to make coverage determinations right away. We're seeing that right now on both what I call the macro level and the micro level. They're basically saying these are all, these are all flood cases. Um, uh, I know my, my house in uh, New Orleans did not flood, and we had filed a claim, and we were told, well, your, your house flooded. It, it was in a flood zone, so therefore there's no coverage, even though we ended up suffering a great deal of wind damage. So very often insurance companies, and, and we're seeing a lot of this now in New Jersey, are just cubbyholing. They're not even going out and looking for the wind damage. You have two policies, uh, hopefully. You have a flood policy and a wind policy. Uh, and if we're going to talk about you know, the, the wind coverage may, may provide some real relief for, for, for people, entities, and organizations. Um, the initial assessment, the most important thing there is they're setting reserves early, uh, and they're also deciding on advanced payments. That's very important. Uh, then there's a general investigation. We try to help uh, by doing our own investigation and offering it as an alternative early on, and then the conclusion of the claim. Um, you know, you agree, denial, litigation, uh, mediation, uh, uh, et cetera. Rule number one, though, read the policy. Rule number two, read the policy again. Uh, so much of this comes down, as Tom was saying, the policy, the policy language. And, uh, you know, we've, we've developed a fair amount of expertise in going through policies, and very often you can find elements of coverage that are not immediately apparent. Um, uh, for example, one, uh, one case that uh, I know Chris and I worked on a few years back, it was a flood was the issue, but the power had gone out beforehand, which caused the sewage system to back up in the house. And we were able to get a recovery under that provision of the contract, even though we couldn't have gotten it for the subsequent flood. Uh, and so, you know, reading, reading the policy carefully always pays, pays off. Um, uh, 
you know, claims related problems. Uh, there are a ton of problems that, that you could be confronting right now, you or your colleagues. You know, there, there's excuses to deny coverage, it's a, it's a flood case, uh, there's a lot of early lowballing, hoping you'll take a number. Uh, the policy language is very ambiguous. If you get to trial, uh, judges are instructed as a matter of law that they have to interpret any ambiguity in favor of finding insurance and in favor of the insured. However, when you're standing there, you know, two years before trial, they're saying, oh, we've got this, this language helps us. And so uh, it's, it's often used as, as a stick, um, we, we find. And so we go in there early, read the policy, and have our story uh, ready to go. Um, I can't tell you how many cases have involved insurance companies who just haven't done a basic investigation, ignoring latent defects. Uh, you've got other issues under insurance, um, et cetera. Um, you know, we talk about unreasonable delays, the rotating adjusters, uh, trying to get a copy, complete copy of your current policy, and so forth. Um, some rules of the road, um, you know, as the insured, you paid for an adjustment, you're entitled to an adjustment. You very often you don't get the adjustment. You have to do it yourself or put together a team to do it. Um, but the adjustment is essential. Uh, the insurance company is supposed to put the insurer's interest ahead of its own. So it's not supposed to be worrying about profitability or how much money they can make or how they can limit their exposure. But uh, we never see that in practice. Well, we see it but too we see it's too rare in practice. Um, the goal, the goal is to pay the total claim, not settle for something less than the total claim. Uh, very often, I think the insurance adjusters are, are thinking about, well, let's just let's get a reasonable number and call it a day. The problem is you've got to live with that property for those 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and if the appropriate work isn't done following uh, the law, it'll probably never get done. It may result in the property being stigmatized uh, down the road. Um, you know, we talked about ambiguity in, pol uh, in policies. Uh, there have been numerous studies, including um, uh, professors at Rutgers who talk about the intentional ambiguity of contracts. Um, uh, what, what I find is that uh, in litigation, they, they usually will end up admitting ambiguity. We, we have an example here, um, I think on the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, in one case, we were uh, representing a, a Fortune 500 company, and they denied the claim. They said there wasn't a satisfactory proof of loss. And, and we went up to Boston, deposed everybody, and nobody at the company could explain what a satisfactory proof of loss was uh, or what the standard was. It just became this ambiguity that their lawyers used to raise yet another defense to try to uh, uh, lead to what, what we felt was an inadequate settlement. We, we ultimately got, that company was offered, I think, $4 million. They eventually got about $32 million uh, because we hung tough. Um, and we, we had to reveal how farcical some of their defenses were. You know, uh, a lot of people will uh, look at pricing issues. They, they, most of these adjusters use computerized pricing systems, and I'm not going to say a lot about that. Uh, I do think it's important to make sure they're honest about pricing. I think very often, though, that's the tail wagging the dog. It's really whether they got the scope uh, appropriate or not. But a lot of people will be talking about, well, I only got X dollars for, for plywood or sheetrock, et cetera. Uh, the question is, are they giving you four feet of sheetrock or eight feet of sheetrock uh, separate from, from pricing issues? And are they looking at structural issues? Um, overhead and profit, if three or more trades uh, are involved, electrician, plumbing, et cetera, you get overhead and profit. Generally, uh, today, um, in a place like Louisiana, it would be 10 and 10. Right after Katrina, if you wanted a good contractor, it was much more than 10 and 10, and we, we insisted that they pay what it took to get a good contractor. I, didn't, I don't know what it's like rebuilding at the, at the Jersey Shore. We had a lot of people drive in from all over the United States, like Tennessee, uh, to do work, but if that guy fixes your roof, 
you can be in Tennessee in two years if you develop a problem. So hiring local, even if it costs a little bit more, is something that, that we believe the insured is entitled to. And um, ah, quick poll. And the right, you know, when entering a claim, the insured must prove existence of the policy, policy terms, and its applicability. The loss is covered by the policy. In other words, uh, you got the policy, uh, you go through the terms, you got to show that the loss is covered, say a windstorm. So the answer is really all of the above, for those of you who care about getting the right answer. Um, and uh, it, it's very, uh, now what happens is if the insured wants to raise an affirmative defense, um, what they have to do is the burden shifts to them. Um, so, for example, looking at the, at the middle bullet, when wind and flood combine to create a loss, the insurer is entitled to recover only that portion of the damage caused solely by wind. So you have to, in effect, in your analysis, segregate out the wind damage from the flood damage. Um, and it's very important to uh, do if you want to maximize your recovery. And uh, Causation is going to be your single biggest issue, which is why you want to bring in a team with the appropriate experts early on. Uh, that's going to probably be the most important thing that you can do. Um, you know, the wind issues are going to be, uh, I think that there's a lot of value that uh, in wind claims in, on the Jersey Shore and inland in New Jersey, which, which are not being uh, addressed adequately at this time as people sort of fall back on it's a flood story. Um, and I, I, I think you owe it to yourself to uh, property owners, property managers, to do full and complete investigation so you don't find out in five years you've got to replace a roofing system that was worn, worn out as a result of this uh, disaster. And um, I, I want to thank you for your, for your time and attention on this important subject, and we're happy to answer any questions uh, that you've got. Uh, just a reminder, please use the question box in your GoToWebinar panel to ask questions. Also, as a reminder, contact information and copies of the presentation can be obtained after the close of the webinar by sending an email to info at wgcpas.com. We now have an, another uh, polling question before I go on to the last speaker. Okay, for those of you who currently are currently involved in a standing claim, uh, the options are trying to handle it on your own or as a board only, using your property manager to assist you, hiring a public adjuster to work with your property manager, haven't filed a claim and don't know where to start. Hopefully we don't have too many of the last one. Please put your answers in. <coughs> Okay, it looks like uh, most of the pressure is on the management, the property manager to get this done. Uh, uh, usually they are very, uh, very educated. Uh, probably have not ever gone through a situation like this before, but uh, certainly that's a good start. But I would suggest to use your uh, whole uh, group of, uh, of professionals. Uh, our final speaker today is uh, Chris Tremaine from Tremaine Enterprises. And, uh, He's got some uh, really cool pictures. He's going to show you damage that you probably never even knew you had uh, had and uh, is quite often missed uh, without the right expert in place. Chris? All right. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you, Alan and Tom, as well. Uh, very thorough presentation and uh, not a lot to elaborate on in regards to policy and protecting your interests as a board or as a property owner. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who's here at this webinar today because you're on point for getting your communities turned around and the fact that you're showing interest in handling your claims property is not only good for you but it's good for everybody in your community and I hope that you take what you're learning here today and you spread the word because you need to get your communities turned around that's important. Uh, I've been known to be a little long-winded, so I'll try to keep this short as we roll through things. What I've been asked to provide is a detailed or quasi-detailed presentation 
on things that are beyond the obvious. And what we're going to dive into here is just kind of a snapshot of what obvious damages are, and then I'm going to walk you through some things that you may or may not be aware have taken place to some of your buildings. Um, following a disaster such as Hurricane Sandy, you're going to have varying degrees of damages. These can compromise the building's envelopes, the mechanical systems, interior finishes. Some of these are going to be very obvious. Some of them are not going to be obvious. Uh, both can be very detrimental to your buildings. Uh, obvious damages. To the untrained eye, and I think Alan touched upon this earlier, um, maintenance people, uh, members of a board or homeowner association that has a construction background may not fully understand the impact of a windstorm or the effects of flood, some of the mechanicals and other issues to a building. Uh, you also have adjusters that because of workload or maybe they're being directed not to really spend a lot of time in regards to investigating damages may not provide you exactly what you need. The obvious damages are easily seen. It's the unobvious damages that are not. Uh, slide 31. I think we would all agree that this is pretty obvious in regards to damages. Um, you now, this is an area down here on the beach. I believe it was in the Long Branch area. Uh, surge had come in and undermined the building and actually pushed it back. Uh, slide number 32. This is a breach on top of a mid-rise building. I, believe it was probably about 10 stories tall. Part of the roofing membrane folded back. This building was, uh, I would consider, a B or C grade building. You have an older ballast roof. The damages were pretty obvious to the corner of the roof. This is just a very small corner of a very large roof system. Uh, slide number 33. It's uh, the cladding that has been removed, or it's a snapshot of the cladding that's been removed from an elevator penthouse. Again, these are obvious damages, but what lies underneath is not so obvious. Less obvious damages. These damages sometimes will go unnoticed or really not considered to be too big of an issue. They can be missed for weeks, months, even years. Unfortunately, this could leave an insured to having to address these damages long after the restoration of the property has taken place, or in a worst case scenario, but when you're unable to approach an insurance company. And this is an important issue. Certain states have statutes of limitation which will restrict you or limit you on being able to approach an insurance company should you find these damages down the road. That's leaving an HOA or an association or a property owner having to paid for these out of their own pocket. So here are some photographs of less obvious visible damages, as we call it. This photograph, uh, number 35, or slide 35, is underneath the cladding uh, that had uh, left the penthouse during a windstorm. I believe it was Hurricane Ike. And the water had run down the inside of the elevator shaft. And what this photograph depicts is some of the counterweights, counterbalances to the elevator car. As you can see, the water ran down the metal material of the weight system and corrosion was starting to take place. No one from the property management firm or the insurance company had taken the time to lower an elevator car to be able to investigate the shaft above the car. Uh, next photograph, photograph 36 is a clay tile on a roofing system. Now, areas of the facility where this photograph was taken had some large pieces that had jettisoned, and the focus was really on some of the larger pieces that had been displaced. Further investigations using equipment to get us up over the top of the roofing system allowed us to get a close-up shot of some of the roof tile. This photograph uh, is basically reflecting a crack in the tile that later will continue to diminish the life expectancy of the roof and will work its way loose. Uh, photograph 37 is a debris impact on a glass curtain system on a high-rise. Um, 
pieces of debris fly around, scuff glass. In many cases, these things go unnoticed until later. Uh, slide 38, water sitting on a windowsill inside of a commercial building, uh, five, four or five stories up. Um, this may seem obvious, not a big deal. The consequences inside the wall cavity actually uh, will be quite worse. Uh, next photograph, 39, a small crack in drywall. Uh, the paper has actually torn on the drywall. Uh, people will go back and paint, and unfortunately the proper method of repair would be to go in and tape so that the crack does not return. Photograph number 40. These are nail pops and drywall finish. As a result of typical wind loading on a building, when you have movement in a building, these are one of the signs that movement has affected some of the finishes. This will trigger other investigations deeper into the wall cavities. Hidden damages. These are damages that without proper thorough investigation will go unnoticed for some time but manifesting issues later down the road. Slide 42, we're back up to the roofing system on the commercial building. We took a core sample of the roof after brushing the gravel back and you will see in slide 43 the lightweight concrete had cracked. Because of this cracking or a result of this cracking will be an effect to the roofing system, will start to affect the uh, roof's ability to withstand lighter load winds and start to wear out the roof system over time from below, creating leaks long after the statute's limitation typically run. Hidden damages. Hidden damages uh, are unseen by the eye and even through investigation, intrusive style investigation in many cases will go unseen. But using equipment such as thermal imaging cameras and moisture meters, we're able to identify this. In slide 45, you will see a photograph of a ceiling and in the foreground. And what you have being held by my hand in the shot is a thermal imaging camera. The darker areas in that thermal imaging camera is a cooler surface. That's moisture while it's evaporating. We are able to run through this commercial building about 80,000 square feet and sweep the underside of the roofing system and identify where the breaches in the building were. Uh, speeds things up and it creates a very thorough investigation. Um, I'm going to try to run through these quickly for everybody here. In photograph 47, we had a tornado create some uplift, uplift pressures, same as Hurricane Sandy would do. And 47 depicts a roof system during the day. Photograph number 48 is the roof system at nighttime. The water that had penetrated the roofing system heated up during the day. At nighttime, when the surface temperature is cooled, the water temperature actually stays up higher at nighttime, and we're able to pick this up on the camera. Further investigations proved that, in fact, water had worked its way underneath the roofing membrane. This was completely overlooked during the first adjustment. Uh, another photograph of hidden damages. This is slide number 50. We have a digital photograph here of an area that was affected by a sewer that had backed up. The next shot, 51, is a thermal imaging picture of the same exact area. You can see the color differentials that drew our attention to do some further investigations. And the moisture meter verified the presence of what we consider cat three or contaminated water, almost 100%. This was not visible to the eye. Um, we had a tornado that ran through Arkansas I believe last year, and on slide number 54, you'll see what looks like a relatively clean looking roof system. The front part of this building took a hit. There was a breach in the building. Doors blew open at the other end of the building. The carrier said that this roof was actually in good condition. Slide number 55 is a general overview of the gymnasium of this building. Slide number 56, you can see the temperature variations in the insulation, kind of circling back to the 80,000 square foot building I had discussed earlier. Uh, we're able to, with 
scientific approaches come in and identify things that most insurance company adjusters or most property owners will not have the ability, the tools, or the time to investigate. And if you roll to slide number 50, we can pass 57, let's go to slide number 58. We got up on a lift, put a moisture meter into the insulation, and proved in fact that there was breaches in the roof system and that insulation was compromised by water. That's an 80% reading, which is very high. Number 59 is some water damage above the T-bar ceiling. For your property management companies that handle commercial buildings, this type of water intrusion can go unnoticed. Rust corrosion takes place and unfortunately mold can as well if things are not taken care of correctly. Here is another shot of the same situation, photograph number 60. This is above the window that I had depicted earlier with less obvious visual damage. As you can see, there is an issue above the window system that causes concern. And I don't think I need to elaborate too much on what water can do when the temperature starts to climb. So long-term effects. Rust, corrosion, perpetual roof repairs, all are things that cost money to repair down the road. This is your opportunity to investigate or have your claim investigated properly to make sure that you have someone that you can go after to finance these repairs at the onset and not down the road. Um, photograph number 62. These are the controls inside the elevator system. These controls rusted, corroded, and could create life safety concerns down the road. Uh, anybody who's ever worked with elevator systems knows the expense of repairing them and even more importantly the cost of modernization to comply with new codes. We're able to get these elevators replaced and modernized with a code upgrade coverage uh, type of policy. And if you let these things go, the expense down the road could be astronomical. Um, number 63, long term. The shot on the left is a photograph that was taken a year after the date of loss. And you can depict the two photographs here. One was immediately following the event, and then a year later, corrosion starting to take place on these metal panels. This diminishes the life expectancy of the panel, and inevitably the building will start to look worn and torn, losing its value very important things to consider. Um, in a nutshell, the diminishment of the structure value is really what we're looking at. That's what an insurance policy is designed to do. It's designed to identify you for your financial loss. Should you not take care of the building, the building will then start to wear and tear. It will start to lose its value and the cost to maintain it will go up. It doesn't look good on the books. It's something that really needs to be considered, not just neglected. In conclusion, this is what we do as a team. A lawyer-led team with consultants on their hip can run through and take care of these properties for you. Ed? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we know we're very close to our time frame, but there's actually a couple of questions on the same subject, and I just want to give the one, this one question to our experts to ask. Some of the, uh, some of the people on here are concerned about whether the cost of higher what the cost of hiring a public adjuster is, um, are any of these costs covered uh, in the insurance claim process, are any of your legal fees, or any of the extras, uh, if the property manager is charging extra, are any of these things covered in the, uh, in the insurance claim? Um, you know, I could probably leave that to Alan when it comes to the lawyer's expenses. Most policies will not provide coverage for public adjusters in some specific state that public adjusters' fees are not covered. Um, you may be able to get creative with property management fees, but I would definitely want professional oversight on how you would present that to a carrier. Alan, would you like to elaborate on the attorney's fees? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, um, you can get attorney's attorney out of, out of uh, under bad faith occasionally, uh, like in Louisiana, Texas, for example, uh, they do have provision for that. However, I think it's a bad question in the sense that it assumes you would get exactly the same with a team as without a team. Uh, we've seen cases 
Um, you know, I can think of 10, 15 cases where co collectively our team has brought in, you know, over 100 million more than the last offer that was, that was made prior to our involvement. And so it's really a little bit apples and oranges. It will, in general, it will come out of the recovery. The insurance company is not obligated to pay for, for any of that. Um, as a practical matter, if they've engaged in some bad faith, there may be some, some wiggle room there. But our goal as, as, as a team is always to get the client enough money that even after they, they have to pay those costs and expenses, uh, they, they, they're able to restore their property to its pre-accident uh, condition. Okay, um, thank you, Alan. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, any of these additional questions that you'd like to ask, you can certainly um, direct to uh, our, our email, public email, info at wgcpas.com. We're circulated around to the experts and get back to you. Also, um, as a note, this uh, whole webinar presentation is going to be available on our website. Uh, www.wgcpas.com um, probably in the next day or so and you'll be able to uh, pass this on to your friends and neighbors and uh, we welcome questions from uh, those that haven't uh, joined us in the in the program and uh, keep in touch and, and let us know how things are going. Uh, we'd like to uh, thank you again for attending the program. Thank you to our speakers and have a great afternoon. Thanks.